Father, as we approach this time in your word, we just ask for a clarity that through your spirit, you uh, might help us not only to see, but to understand and to grasp the ramifications of what your word has for us today. And so we give you thanks for your word and for this time in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, last week we considered the huge question around which the book of Hebrews essentially revolves, and that is, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation as that which comes through Jesus' atoning death? The reality is no one who ignores Jesus Christ's gift of salvation can escape hell. No one. And today we explore that when man sinned against God, he lost more than just a relationship with God that was holy and unsoiled. He lost more than everlasting life. When man lost his relationship with God, he also lost the meaning of his existence. Hebrews 2, verses 5 to 9, our reading this morning, teach us what man's intended purpose is, how and why it was lost, and how it can be recovered in the exalted Lord our Saviour. You might not see that glaringly obvious as you read it through, but this passage does teach us of this. We see, first of all, man's purpose revealed, and that's in verse 5. The writer to the Hebrews, and he's anonymous, we don't know who he was, there are a few theories. But the writer says, in breaking into his talk about angels, he kind of puts in a parenthesis, and that's what this is here. So in the middle of talking about uh, the angels and how Jesus Christ is superior to them, he says, it is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. So God has not subjected the world to come to angels, we're told. And the word subjected meant arranging soldiers in order under a commander. And it came to be used for any system of administration. So it's not to angels that he has subjected the world to come. Verse 5 is telling us that God will not turn over the administration of the world to come to angels. When all sin is dealt with, all corruption gone, and the eternal kingdom of God is established, although we might think that the angels will be ruling with God over it all, that is actually not the case. The Greek word translated world comes from the base word for dwelling place or house, and it means the dwelled in earth, the inhabited earth. There is an inhabited earth to come, but it is different than our present one, which according to Zechariah chapter 14 and Isaiah chapters 11 and 35 is going to be significantly changed one day. So the earth as we know it is going to look and feel and uh, behave very differently in days to come. The earth will have significant changes to it, and so will characteristics of animals and their behaviour. There will even be differences in people through redemption and glorification. But the point of verse 5 is that angels will not be ruling this world to come. Now, at present, Satan and his fallen angels do have significant rule over our world. We don't see them, but there are angels evil angels um, that are involved in ruling behind the scenes under Satan. God's holy angels fight against the fallen angels to reduce their evil impact in the world and to seek to carry out God's will in opposition to Satan's schemes. So in effect, there is a kind of angelic joint rulership happening in our world one of opposites in extreme conflict, battling for earth's control. But in the world to come, angels will not rule. The evil angels will be dealt with. They will be sentenced uh, to hell 
with Satan and locked away forever. And the holy angels will be serving God, but not in a position of authority or rule. In the world to come, angels will not rule, man will. That is his destiny, and that was what it was meant to be from the very beginning. It was the purpose for which he was created. You were actually created to rule in this world. Don't believe me? Go back to the very first book. Go back to Genesis, to chapter 1, 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So... God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Man was created as the king of the earth, and in God's final destiny for him, man will one day be the sovereign that his creator designed him to be. Continuing in our passage from Hebrews 2, we read in verse 6, But there is a place where someone has testified, What is mankind? That you are mindful of them, a son of man, that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honour and put everything under their feet. Now, it was David who composed Psalm 8, from which the writer of Hebrews quotes here. These verses refer to mankind, and in them we see God's planned purpose and destiny for humans in general. David had wondered, God... You have done all this, but why? What is tiny, fragile, insignificant man in the vastness of space that you have done so much for him? What right do we have to be so much in the mind of God is what David is kind of getting at in his psalm. The psalmist goes on to answer his own question in verse 7 of our passage. It says, You made them a little lower than the angels, you crowned them with glory and honour and put everything under their feet. God made man to be ruler over his world and to be exercising dominion over it all. God has placed us on this earth to rule. Freshly created in innocence and purity, mankind was God's crowning masterpiece, more glorious than any other created being, any other creature, and was lifted to a place of honour over them all as the masters of the earth. Verse 8, the second part says, in putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. God put everything under Adam and Eve. He put everything under mankind. Everything. It says, God left nothing that is not subject to them. People were given existence by God to govern and caretake his beautiful earth. When God created humans, we are told that he made them a little lower than the angels. Now, mankind is not lower in their personhood or importance than angels. God, the Father, Son, and Spirit said, let us make man in our own image, and he did. It is not said that he made the angels in his own image, but he made man in the very image of God. It is not said that God gave the angels a kingdom to reign over, but he did give man 
a kingdom back in the Garden of Eden. So man is not lower in significance or value or personhood than the angels. No. When it says he made us a little lower than the angels, not in importance, not in significance, not in their value as people, as individuals. But it is true that angels are heavenly creatures while man is earthbound. We know that all well enough. This is a limiting and major difference for mankind. Man is a creature of the earth and is confined by his physicality to it. Uh, you and I cannot enter into the heavens. We might have a rocket ship, that, a spaceship that might take us a certain way out into space, but that's not in, into the spiritual um, realms. We, we cannot because we are human and we're finite and uh, we're bound by time and space. But angels dwell in the spiritual. But it's interesting, though, we are confined to the physical. Angels are not confined to the spiritual realm in which they dwell. They're able to come to earth at will and traverse between the physical and non-physical worlds, abiding invisibly or taking human form and physicality. We just need to read through the scriptures and we'll see physical visitation by angels they have supernatural strength that even sinless man at his creation did not have. You uh, read through the book of Daniel, we know that Michael struggled and resisted against um, one of the uh, against Satan, basically, um, and he fought with him, uh, and the two fought for many, many days, and as a result, um, the uh, the power of, of Satan was was repressed. But angels have huge strength and angels have direct and continual access to God in his throne room. That's something that's quite different to our human access that we have from earth, here on earth. So man is a little lower than the angels in what we can call physical limitations. But man had a privilege not given to the angels for God, we are told, in putting everything under them, under humans, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet Hebrews 2 verse 8 continues by saying, Yet, at present, we do not see everything subject to them. That's the reality, isn't it? That's the truth of the world we live in. Why is that? Well, God's decree was that everything in creation was put in subjection to humans. But the dominion of the earth given to Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, that dominion was only briefly held by them. They promptly lost the God-given dominion for which they had been created. How? Well, you know the answer something drastic happened. Man's revealed destiny was restricted by Adam and Eve's sin, their disobedience, their rebellion to God. Not only were Adam and Eve corrupted by their disobedience and rebellion, but their sin subjected the earth to corruption as well. Adam sinned and he lost his kingdom and his crown. And this is why we do not now see the earth subject to man. Genesis 3 tells us, starting in verse 17, to Adam he said, this is the Lord speaking, this is after they sinned, after they rebelled, and man has been uh, hauled onto the carpet and he is being addressed and he is being rebuked and he is being punished. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since 
from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. The earth originally was subject to man, and it supplied all his needs without him having to do anything. He had only to accept and enjoy the earth as it was provided for him. Then, tempted by Satan, man sinned, and his tempter usurped the crown. And there you see the change in the chain of command. Man fell to the bottom, and the earth, under the evil one, now rules man. Even with all our modern technology, we must constantly fight against the earth for our survival. Death entered when mankind sinned, and so did murder and violence and immorality and all kinds of evil. The earth produced thorns and thistles, floods and droughts. Even the animal kingdom turned in fear of man instead of serving him peacefully as originally intended. Virtually everything God had given for man's good and blessing became his enemy. And man has been fighting against the earth ever since. The earth is dying with him. And interestingly, the earth knows it. It might be a strange thing to say, but Romans 8, 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul says, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Man was forced by God to be reminded of his sin by having to fight against the very earth that was designed to be his servant. However, Romans 8 reveals that when the new kingdom begins, verse 21 says, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Now, keep in mind, this is after the cross. This is after Christianity is up and running. And this is 2,000 years ago. And the earth is still groaning as it waits in eager anticipation for the revelation to come. Now, aware of its curse due to Adam's sin, the earth is groaning. It's waiting for the day when God places his redeemed people in the role of rulers over the earth, which itself is, like mankind, on that day, liberated from corruption and decay. A day is coming when, in the wonderful plan of God, the dominion that man lost will be given to him again. In the coming kingdom, man's purpose will be recovered by Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2 verse 9 says, But, in contrast to all that's been talked about, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honour because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. The ultimate curse of man's lost destiny is death. The only way man can ever be king again is to have the curse removed. The only way the curse can be removed is for the penalty to be paid. Jesus Christ died paying sin's penalty for each and every one who will receive that payment by faith, by trust, in humility. To regain man's dominion, Jesus, the second Adam, as the Apostle Paul called him, had to experience death for man. If a man dies for his own sin, he's doomed to hell forever. Romans 5 verses 8 and 9 tell us, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified by his blood, 
How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? See, because Christ died in our place, he conquered death. Now, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're saved, the curse is removed, and we become joint heirs with him in the eternal kingdom. Obviously, if we're going to reign on earth as kings, there will have to be a kingdom. And when Christ returns, he will judge the world and he will set up his millennial kingdom. He will have redeemed ones live and reign with him in that kingdom for a thousand years before the regeneration of the universe and the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth, which will exist then into eternity. In the new Jerusalem on the new earth, God's throne is established forever. Revelation 22 verses 3 through 5 states, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light. And notice what it says next. And they will reign forever and ever. We will one day be kings and queens with our great king, the king of kings. The redeemer king will rule with his redeemed saints over the earth as it was meant to be. And right now, as we read in our verses, Jesus is exalted. He is on the throne. Jesus is raised up after having taken our penalty and died the death for us. He has been exalted by the Lord. And the day comes when we will join in that kind of position and place as joint heirs with Christ, but ruling and reigning with Christ. And it's not to the angels, as amazing creatures as they are, that this honour has been bestowed. It's bestowed on us. It was the very reason for which we were created. Christ tasted death for you and me. He did it to recover our lost destiny. And if you've been groping around trying to figure out why you exist, I hope you know the reason now. There is no reason for us to be slaves. There is no reason for us to be paupers. There is only reason for us to be kings. Men today still ask, what is man? The idolater and the animist says, man is inferior to birds and animals, even to creeping things, stones and sticks. And he bows down and he worships the snake. The materialist says, man is obviously higher than any of the other animals, but he is still only the product of chance, the result of evolutionary natural selection. Most people believe such ideas or ones equally as foolish. But God says, man was created to be king of the earth. Only for a little time has he been made lower than the angels. Someday he will be given a throne and reign with Jesus Christ in his kingdom. I trust you will be there with me as together we reign and rule with our Saviour King Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that although our ancestors lost the kingdom for us, and so we lost our divine purpose for which you created us, you have given your life to one day restore the kingdom to us. We eagerly look forward to and long for that glorious day. Meanwhile, please help us to live faithfully as your servants, helping others to come to know and realise their divine purpose in Christ. Amen.